Hello, this is part of the controlled environment plant production engineering slash technology education modules that were developed and presented by the Ohio State University, Rutgers University, and the University of Arizona with support from the USDA NEFA program. This presentation is about heating systems for greenhouses. Uh, my name is AJ Both and I work for Rutgers University. The learning objectives for this module are that by the end of this slide presentation, you will be able to identify and compare different systems used for heating greenhouses, and you will be able to select heating energy use strategies based on potential savings. Additional resources include several websites, um, as well as books, including Greenhouse Engineering, Energy Conservation for Commercial Greenhouses, Greenhouse Operation and Management, uh, the Ball Red Book on Greenhouses and Equipment, as well as several standards by both the National Greenhouse Manufacturers Association and the Agricultural, the American Association for Agricultural and Biological Engineers. So what are greenhouse heating systems? There's a, a variety of different approaches from steam to hot air to hot water uh, in different locations in the greenhouse structure, uh, as well as uh, alternative heating systems so, such as biomass heating or using heat from waste uh, systems, typically from large industrial operations. Um, and we'd like, I'm going like to I'm gonna review all of those uh, throughout your throughout this uh, presentation. So in this slide you see uh, several uh, common installation systems for both hot water and hot air uh, heating systems in greenhouses. We can have, uh, for example, pipes uh, along the overhead and perimeter of the greenhouse. We can have pipes underneath benches. We can have pipes uh, in between rows of plants that can also be used for transportation purposes, for example in, in tomato crops or pepper crops. Um, we can have floor heating systems where we put heating pipes inside the floor. That could be a dirt floor, it could be a concrete floor. Um, we can have only perimeter heating, typically with additional uh, fan capacity to distribute that heat uniformly. Um, we can have overhead unit heaters, uh, sometimes operated by steam, typically operated by, by hot air, and very often installed along the end walls that then blow uh, jets of warm air throughout the greenhouse environment. In order to improve the uh, distribution of that warm air, we can attach a poly tube to the outlet of one of those unit heaters, and then air comes out small holes all along the length of those poly tubes trying to uh, distribute that heat more uniformly through the entire greenhouse uh, environment. And we can install those polytubes overhead, or in some cases when there is space, we can install them uh, underneath the benches um, to help uh, provide more uniform heating throughout the greenhouse structure. Here's an example of a large steam boiler. I mentioned these steam boilers are not very common anymore, but some older greenhouses still operate them. Uh, they're very often uh, uh, fired by uh, burning coal, uh, and so this is a, a system that, uh, although uh, possible, it's not often used anymore because of the issues uh, related to burning coal. More common are hot air heating systems, as you see several of them in this uh, slide. Uh, we have unit heaters that, as I mentioned, typically are installed along sidewalls that blow uh, jets of warm air into the greenhouse, uh, an issue of, of uh, how we provide a combustion air and how we expel that combustion air is of a concern and so sometimes we see systems that have separated uh, pathways for the incoming air that's used for combustion as well as the exhaust air to try to not have uh, any of that air be in contact with the greenhouse environment to try to prevent any potential problems with uh, gases that may contaminate the greenhouse environment. Um, but uh, as you can see in the 
three pictures showing actual heating systems. Typically, when we have hot air systems, we have uh, strong jets of warm air located from uh, fixed locations in the greenhouse, and that creates issues with distributing that air more uniformly. So on the lower right-hand image, you can see a, a uh, polytube, at, at, in this case running overhead, uh, that's inflated uh, by the fan attached to the uh, unit heater, and then warm air is allowed to escape through little openings along the entire length of the tube uh, in order to more uniformly distribute that, that heat throughout the greenhouse environment. Hot water systems typically uh, have a large boiler in which we combust our fuel source. A lot of pipes uh, filled with water surround the combustion chamber. That water heats up and then is pumped around to the various uh, locations in the greenhouse. Typically we divide the greenhouse into zones and we can control the amount of heat that we deliver to each of those zones by, by valves that we open and close allowing more or less water to run through the entire plumbing system. So you see some examples of uh, tubes delivering that heat. On the upper right hand side you see perimeter pipes along the outside wall uh, to transport water. Uh, and on the two lower pictures you see on the left hand side uh, pipes designed with fins to increase the uh, convective heat loss uh, from those pipes. And you also see on the lower right-hand side uh, an installation of a floor heating system just prior to the concrete being poured over those uh, heating tubes that are th then embedded in the concrete and provide for a very uniform uh, heating system. One of the questions that uh, most growers ask when they think about heating is which one is better, a hot air heating system or a hot water system? Typically, I recommend that hot water systems are preferred over uh, hot air systems because of the increase in uh, uniformity for the distribution of that heat. So it's, it's easier to do a better uh, uniform distribution when you have a hot water system. However, hot air systems are typically cheaper to install. So that can be a major uh, consideration for growers deciding between either two of these systems. And hot water systems very often require uh, water treatment because we typically have dissimilar metals in, in various components of our heating system and those dissimilar metals can cause uh, corrosion and premature failure if we do not treat the water properly. So you have to take that into consideration when you have a hot water system you typically need some kind of water treatment to make sure you minimize any corrosion that might occur in your system. If you have a root zone heating system, so either the pipes embedded in the floor or pipes directly on, on the bench, um, that is probably the, the best uh, system for uh, pr distributing that heat very uniformly. But we can only provide so much heat to those heating systems because remember we grow the plants typically on the floor or on the bench. Uh, and if we, we crank up the temperature in those heating systems too high, uh, plants will be negatively affected. So we can only rely on a, a base load of heating that can be provided from a, a floor or a bench uh, heating system. And the additional heating capacity needs to be provided by additional plumbing, typically overhead uh, heating pipes or additional unit heaters in the greenhouse operation. The, the root zone heating system can of course be is of course installed very close to the crop, so we typically provide heat directly where it's needed and as a result we may be able to reduce the overall air temperature inside the greenhouse uh, and that may of course be uh, saving us some energy. Uh, so that may be an interesting strategy uh, if you want to try it, but keep in mind that uh, reducing the air temperature in the greenhouse could have a negative impact on on plant growth and development. So if you want to try this strategy, I always recommend to do this on a small scale first to see if it works before you do it in your entire uh, greenhouse operation. Components of hot water heating systems include uh, the boiler, obviously. You need to have a place where you can bust your fuel and when you heat the water. And then you need to distribute that water 
uh, throughout your greenhouse operation. So typically we have pumps to pump water around and we have valves. Sometimes we have three-way valves, sometimes we use four-way valves to try to uh, push that water around through your plumbing system to bring it to the location where it's needed to help heat the greenhouse environment. So this slide shows you uh, simplistically two different designs for whether you have uh, three-way valves in your heating system or four-way valves. Um, you can do it either way, it's just a different design uh, system that uh, people have used for heating, for designing heating systems in, in greenhouses. This image shows you a small uh, circulation pump that's typically installed in your system to try to push water around. And so depending on, on the heat requirement of a particular zone, uh, this pump can be engaged and then draws uh, hot water from the supply line into the zone and then distributes, distributes it through the plumbing system uh, to make sure you get uniform heating throughout your greenhouse. Here's an, a close-up of a three-way mixing valve. Uh, you can see on the right hand side hot water is being supplied by the boiler, so the, the boiler pump is uh, pushing water uh, through the system and then the three-way mixing valve is connected to a temperature sensor, uh, typically a temperature sensor both uh, for the water as well as the greenhouse environment and then uh, depending on the control algorithm that we use to control uh, the temperature in the greenhouse, the, the mixing valve is opened or closed depending on the need uh, to allow more hot water or less hot water supply to enter into the zone to maintain the proper temperature. So it's an easy system once it's installed and it, it allows for uh, pretty precise control of the temperature that we uh, distribute to the greenhouse environment. And here you see an image of an installation with four-way mixing valves and you also see in blue, the circulation pumps that are used for each of those zones to pump water around uh, when needed. There's different designs for the heating pipes we use with hot water systems. They can be smooth, they can be uh, equipped with, with fins in various uh, designs to try to increase the convective heat loss on those pipes to make sure that energy that we provide in the form of hot water is as quickly and as completely released into the greenhouse environment as possible. An example of uh, root zone systems are using uh, bench heating. On the lower left hand side you see uh, a bench heating system used uh, to produce plugs or seedlings. Uh, so little uh, rubber tubes are installed directly on top of the bench and then the, the plant trays, the seedling trays, are placed directly on top of the, the heating tubes and you see a little pump with a, uh, a distribution system that uh, allows the water to circulate through those tubes to provide a uniform temperature directly uh, to the, the root zone of those seedlings grown on top of the bench. On the upper right hand side you see uh, moving tables and uh, below the support for the tables you see white uh, pipes that deliver hot water uh, to the greenhouse zone. These pipes are installed a little bit further down from the bottom of the, the tables because we typically run a little bit warmer water through those uh, pipes in this particular configuration and therefore we need to increase the distance slightly between the bottom of the tables and where we install the heating pipes so as not to do any damage to the, to the plants. Or uh, we can have these floor heating systems. Here you see an example of a floor heating system. This floor is uh, a sand mixture except for the concrete walk walkways. A sand gravel mixture uh, covered with a landscape fabric and then embedded in the sand uh, is, uh, uh, are these tubes that we used to, to provide the hot water that then provide uh, the heating uh, to this crop. So loops of pipes run back and forth uh, picking up water from the, the larger supply pipe on the right hand side and returning water to the return line that then brings that water back to the boiler for reheating. Um, so once it's installed it's a very easy system to uh, maintain 
the proper temperature in the greenhouse. As I mentioned, uh, because we provide this heat so close to the crop, it is possible in some cases to maintain a lower aerial temperature inside the greenhouse. And that, of course, uh, uh, allows for some additional energy savings. But that is a, a system that you need to uh, investigate properly before you can uh, implement it, because lower air temperatures could have an effect on plant growth and development. Here's an example of a concrete floor heating system, uh, but it also serves in this case as an irrigation system. So the, the concrete floor was installed and before we installed the concrete floor, a tubing system, a piping system was uh, positioned carefully uh, underneath the floor that allows to either uh, pump water up on the floor or uh, drain water from the floor back into a holding tank. So after we poured the concrete, uh, we drilled holes through the concrete into uh, the plumbing system that we installed prior to pouring the concrete. Uh, so it's critical that you remember where you uh, put those uh, pipes because after you pour the concrete, you will no longer see them. Uh, but after we, we uh, drilled holes into the plumbing system, uh, this system is now able to use uh, or to provide both heat as well as, as water and nutrients to the plants. Uh, and, and so once it's installed, it's, an, it's a very nice uh, system because there's low maintenance and the irrigation system depends only on one pump uh, turning on and off uh, and your entire crop can be uh, irrigated uh, very easily that way. There are uh, other systems that we can use for heating greenhouses. Here's an example of a cogeneration system or what we sometimes call a combined heat and power system where one single uh, piece of equipment generates both electricity and then we collect the waste heat typically from the exhaust gases but perhaps also from the, the engine itself. Uh, for example, from the, the uh, lubrication oils that are used to uh, lubricate the engine we can collect that waste heat that would otherwise be um, going out the stack uh, uh, with a heat exchanger and then use that heat to help heat the greenhouse. That's, that's exactly what we did in this case. We have a, a micro turbine that uses landfill gas to generate electricity. The electricity can be used on site in the greenhouse, for example, for the supplemental lighting system, or any excess electricity can be exported to the local grid. And then the waste heat that was produced uh, during the generation of electricity is collected in a heat exchanger and also returned to the greenhouse uh, for heating purposes. So we use a single fuel source both for electricity generation as well as uh, for the production of heat. And by doing so, we increase the overall system efficiency, which obviously has, has advantages. These days, with high, relatively high fuel prices, uh, particularly fuel oil, growers are looking more and more into alternative uh, energy sources, and one energy source is biomass. It could be wood, it could be other plant materials, um, but biomass has good potential as a fuel source for heating greenhouses. So in this image, you see several pictures of an operation that uses shredded wood, uh, that's transported to the site, dumped in large piles, and then transported using various conveyor systems to the biomass boiler. And the biomass boiler uh, is operated uh, at the highest efficiency possible. And what that means is that if the greenhouse requires a little bit of heat, the biomass boiler still operates at its intended efficiency. So instead of producing a little bit of heat, the biomass boiler is probably operated at, at its highest efficiency, which means that only a little bit of heat goes into the greenhouse and the remaining heat that's being produced is stored in the form of hot water in this very large yellow uh, insulated storage tank. So by doing this, by operating the boiler at its highest efficiency as much as possible and storing any, storing any excess heat temporarily, uh, we can again increase the overall efficiency of this system and obviously that stored heat can then be used at a later time during the day or even in the evening uh, 
so that we can maintain that high efficiency of the heating system uh, as much as possible. Many commercial and industrial processes also generate waste heat. Here's an example of a power plant with a large cooling tower. Uh, so instead of uh, cooling their, uh, their water in the cooling tower, uh, the, using the cooling tower for their cooling purposes, we can tap into that process and run a large pipe with water to a greenhouse operation and then uh, expel the heat that otherwise would be expelled in the cooling tower inside the greenhouse. So if you have a, a circumstance where you are located near an industrial process that generates waste heat, by using heat exchanges and transportation pipes, you can probably tap into this otherwise waste uh, heat source. One of the challenges, however, with systems like this is that um, once this particular power plant, for example, shuts down for maintenance, your heat source disappears. So uh, it's not a, a situation where you can rely entirely on this waste energy source. You do have to have a backup system in place for periods of time when you do need heat, but in this case the power plant has been shut down for maintenance or for repair issues. Some growers are interested in using radiant heat or infrared heat, and those systems are uh, usable in greenhouses, but I have some reservations uh, using these systems. One of the advantages that people often cite is that they provide instantaneous heat. Once you turn them on and they start radiating, you immediately uh, feel that heat energy either on your skin or if you are a plant on, on your, the surface of your leaves. Um, so it, it's a very quick response time when you need heat energy. But the challenge is that the heat is uh, transmitted by radiation, so only surfaces that are in direct view of the, the radiator uh, will receive that heat energy. And when you think about a, a, a plant canopy with multiple layers of leaves, typically leaves shade each other, so not all leaves will be in direct view of the, the radiator. And as a result, it's, it's possible to get uneven heating uh, of your plant canopy. Uh, and that can be an issue, of course. Um, it does allow for lower air temperature, however, because you're only interested in heating surfaces. So in this case, we would be interested in heating plant surfaces. So you don't worry necessarily about the surrounding air temperature. And of course, when you have a lower air temperature, uh, you, can, you can generate some savings. Another issue with these systems is that you need to install them a certain distance away from the canopy in order to improve the uniformity of heat distribution, and especially in older greenhouses, lower greenhouses, uh, that can be a challenge. We don't always have enough space to place these units far enough away from the plants to provide a uniform uh, heat distribution. Another system that uh, I think has a lot of merit for greenhouse heating is uh, ground source heat pumps. Uh, this particular picture shows you an installation for a residential home, but it works the same for a greenhouse operation. There's different ways to to install these systems. You're making use of the nearly constant temperature of the soil uh, several feet down. Uh, and so in the, in the winter time, that soil temperature is typically warmer than the surrounding air temperature and we can extract heat from that soil. In the summertime, that uh, stable temperature is typically colder uh, than uh, the air temperature surrounding your greenhouse. And then we can dump heat uh, into the ground. So we make use of, of that constant soil temperature at several feet deep uh, to either extract energy or dump energy into. And that allows us then to, to get a, a relatively high overall system efficiency as is expressed by this, this COP number, this coefficient of performance number that tells you something about how many units of energy we get out of this system for the unit of energy that we need to put in. So you can see a typical coefficient of performance of, of three or perhaps a little bit higher is possible. So for every unit of energy that we need to put in the system, we can get three units of energy out. So that tells you that it's a, 
a pretty, uh, from an energy point of view, a pretty efficient system uh, to operate. Um, in addition, for greenhouse operations, I think it is very useful to consider when you are thinking about ground source heat pump systems to consider an energy storage uh, container, uh, typically in the form of an insulated hot water tank, to further increase overall system efficiency and performance. So having a ground source heat system with a way to store heat temporarily, store energy temporarily in the form of hot water can further help uh, increase the overall system efficiency. And here you see an example of a greenhouse operation with a large insulated storage tank just for that purpose, to increase the overall efficiency of your heating system. It can be very helpful to store excess water during certain periods of the time when you're trying to operate your heating system at, the maximum, at its maximum efficiency and then use that stored energy later uh, when needed. There are several heating system considerations that I think you, you need to think about. Um, always have a service contract for every heater. It's easy to forget and then uh, sooner or later you will run into a problem and obviously uh, from experience I can tell you that those problems often occur at the most inopportune moments, late at night or, or on the weekends. Um, when you do have a hot water system it's important that you put your boiler in a separate room. This is done for fire safety issues. Typically the fire code tells you that you have certain materials, that you need certain materials to construct that room with. It's all done to, to reduce the, uh, the, the possibility of having a massive fire in your operation. When you think about uh, unit heaters, uh, we're talking now about air heating systems, hot air heating systems, I think it makes sense to try to uh, consider separated combustion systems. I addressed this before, where the combustion air uh, is taken in from the outside and also expelled to the outside, so there is no uh, opportunity for contamination inside uh, the greenhouse environment by any of the combustion gases, some of which can be very harmful to plants. If possible, I think it's a good idea to install a dual fuel system where you have the option of switching depending on availability and pricing. So we've seen growers have both fuel oil as well as natural gas and depending on availability and pricing, they can then switch, they can use the same uh, burner system, same uh, heating system, but they can switch fuel sources to try to uh, reduce their overall cost. If you're really concerned about uniformity, I think it's, uh, it's really critical to think about hot water system because they are able to provide heat more uniformly compared to hot air system. And then really, uh, I think the best hot water system is a, a floor heating system uh, it really cr or, or a bench heating system. It creates highly uniform heat distribution. Um, we provide that heat very close to the crop where it's really needed. Um, and in the case of a floor heating system, especially when that floor is, is a concrete floor, uh, the heat stored in that floor can act as a buffer for an hour or more uh, in case you have a, a maintenance issue or a, 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 a breakdown. In other heating systems, for example, with unit heaters, when there's a breakdown, you have no heat and there is no buffer. But in the case of a, a concrete slab that you heated for many hours, that concrete slab will release heat slowly and can act as a buffer, uh, so to give you a little bit more time to, uh, to work on your repairs. We always want to uh, prevent incomplete combustion in any heating system because incomplete combustion can generate uh, a bunch of gases, a bunch of off products, byproducts that are not uh, uh, particularly healthy to plants. Think about uh, ethylene or carbon monoxide, which is both unhealthy to plants as well as humans. So always make sure you have complete combustion in your system, and you do that by checking the the exhaust gas temperature as well as the carbon monoxide concentration in your exhaust. And this is something that I recommend you, you have a, a licensed uh, contractor do, somebody who knows heating systems, who works with heating systems and who, who is capable of, of making adjustments when necessary. Something you can do yourself, I think, is regularly clean any heat exchanges in your heating system. 
they typically collect dust, and the more dust you have on your heat exchanger, the, the, the less the efficiency of heat exchange is. When you use a heater or boiler, uh, it's always important to, to provide enough makeup air because oxygen obviously is needed for combustion of the fuel sources that we use. And without enough uh, makeup air, enough oxygen, that combustion is, is not working properly and we can have the opportunity of creating all these byproducts that we don't want. So always make sure you have sufficient makeup air when you have uh, heating systems in your, in your operation. Maintain sufficient updraft in your stacks. Again, we, wanna any, uh, we want to remove any uh, exhaust gases from your system as quickly as possible and as completely as possible. Uh, and therefore, we want to locate the stack openings at least two feet above the highest point of your, of your structure to make sure that uh, the wind uh, can carry the exhaust gases away as best as possible. And another tip would be to insulate any transportation pipes that you use to transport your heat, whether that's hot air or hot water, from your fuel, from your uh, boiler system uh, to the location into the greenhouse where you'd like it to be released. Any transportation pipes in that section between the generation of heat and the release of heat uh, should be insulated to try to uh, reduce any unwanted heat loss. There are systems that we can use um, to not only uh, provide heating, but also uh, provide some humidity control. Uh, so our heating system can, can play a critical role in humidity control as well, in addition to providing heating. We have a, a, a practice or a strategy that is called heat and vent that you can implement to try to reduce uh, high humidities in the greenhouse because high humidities can be detrimental uh, to plant growth because they typically provide a nice environment for uh, diseases such as mildew and rust and botrytis to, uh, to take a hold and to spread. So we'd like to remove the moisture as much as possible to keep plant surfaces as dry as possible to prevent these issues from uh, coming up. So we make use in, in this heat and vent strategy uh, of two physical principles. We warm air by engaging the heating system and then we, uh, by heating that air, it can contain more moisture, it can pick up more moisture. Warm air is able to hold more moisture. And then um, we'd like to maintain uh, leaf temperatures that are above the, the air dew point temperature because the dew point temperature, uh, if we drop below that temperature, we will see condensation. So by keeping uh, leaf temperatures above our air dew point temperature, we can prevent the condensation. We don't have moisture on our, our, our plant surfaces. So the strategy that's then deployed is that we first heat the greenhouse environment by engaging the heating system. We typically also engage uh, some mixing by, in, by operating uh, fans, typically horizontal airflow fans, to mix that warm and moist air to pick up as much moisture as possible and then we open the windows to, or, or engage the ventilation system to vent that hot and moist air to the outside. So we drive the moisture out of the greenhouse in this process. Yes, it does uh, require energy. You need to heat the greenhouse air and you need to run the ventilation system. But uh, that's a compromise we make uh, to try to prevent any disease issues from, from uh, becoming a problem. In this slide, I'm showing you uh, some potential savings and some strategies that you can follow or, or equipment installations that you can make to, uh, to generate energy savings. Um, I want to point out though that it's always uh, best to start with conservation measures first before you start thinking about installing uh, systems to reduce your fuel consumption. So always look at conservation measure first. What can you do to reduce your energy consumption before you start installing new systems? But if you are at the point where you're considering installing new systems, then here's a list of options that you have and also some potential savings that each of these uh, systems may be able to provide you. Keep in mind that the savings that I list here are not additive. In other words, you cannot 
just pick two or three of these systems and install them and then add the savings that are listed here and expect those savings to, to materialize. These uh, savings are ballpark numbers and typically there are interactions between uh, different approaches so it's, it's not possible to just add the numbers that I give you here uh, when you are considering uh, any of these systems for your installation. So adding an energy curtain uh, is probably one of your best options. Um, it's relatively inexpensive and it can save you about 30% on your heating costs throughout an average year. Uh, if you have an option of installing new heaters or boiler systems, always investigate uh, the efficiency and, and you will find that newer systems typically have much higher efficiencies than older systems. So again, you can generate some significant savings by increasing the efficiency of your current heating system. If you have a, a, an oil system, an option is to install a flame retention burner uh, that mixes the fuel and the combustion air a little bit better and that results in savings as well. I always recommend to, uh, to do timely maintenance, either yourself or have a, a contractor come in to do maintenance on your heating system and you'd be surprised at the savings you'll be able to, uh, to uh, realize if you do this uh, in a timely fashion. We, we also see savings possible uh, by using computer control and, and variable speed motors and fans and pumps. Um, savings of as much as 10% uh, have been realized by some greenhouse operations by using uh, this particular strategy. You can also lower your heating uh, system temperatures or your greenhouse temperatures, but again, as I stressed before, that can have an impact on plant growth and development, so you should uh, investigate that properly before you decide to implement that strategy. When you do have insulation materials in your greenhouse, for example, along perimeter walls or when you insulate heating pipes uh, or ducts, always use the highest R value that you can afford uh, to make sure you, you reduce heat loss as much as possible. Um, and if you are lucky enough to be able to install a new uh, greenhouse system, uh, perhaps a combined heat and power system or a cogeneration system would be an option for you. As I show you here, savings of about 50% have been realized by by other operations that have installed these systems. So potentially it's a, it's a uh, system that can save a lot, but it's probably uh, uh, more applicable to new installations compared to retrofits. We'd like to acknowledge the funding that was received for this effort by the USDA NEFA program. <laughs>